أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته عليكم السلام الحمد لله we left off at ayah number 29 from سورة الأنعام and inshallah, I think tonight we'll be able to cover about potentially about four verses. And I apologize that we're not able to cover more ayat, but I think it's important for us to to uh, to give each ayah its due right and not give you a uh, you know uh, a session where we're compromising the uh, the quality. So if we turn to ayah number twenty nine, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Waqalu in hiya illa hayatun dunya." وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُوثِينَ And they say, there is nothing except our worldly life, and we will not be resurrected. Now, the commentators of the Holy Qur'an have put forward two opinions regarding this verse. A group of commentators argue that this ayah is actually connected to the conversation that Allah has with the disbelievers in ayah number 28 in the previous verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if I were to send them back because the kuffar the disbelievers when they are when they are presented before the hellfire when they see their final abode, when they see that frightening punishment, they cry out, Oh Allah, send us back. Send us back to dunya, and we promise that we will believe in your signs. Allah here says that even if I were to grant them their request, if I were to send them back to dunya, to the worldly life, they would go back to their old ways. They would, they would continue in their rebelliousness and their rejection. So some commentators of the Qur'an, they say, ayah number 29 is what they would say if Allah were to send them back. Meaning, if Allah sends them back, not only will they sin, but they will actually deny the resurrection that they experienced. So some commentators, they say, وَقَالُوا إِنْ هِيَ, حيا... إن... إن هي إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُوثِينَ Allah is highlighting that even if I send them back, they will transgress and they will go back to what I prohibited them from, and they will also deny Qiyamah, even though they've seen it and they've witnessed it. So this is one opinion that, uh, that the scholars have put forward. The second view is that, no, this is an entirely different conversation. This is a new sentence, if you will, whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about a specific group of disbelievers who reject any form of resurrection. Now, brothers and sisters, it's important for us to understand that the pagans in Arabia they're not a homogenous group of people. They're not a monolithic group of people, meaning there is religious diversity even among the pagans. So you find that some of the kuffar, some of the pagans rejected resurrection entirely. They, they denied any form of resurrection. Whereas other pagans believed that there will be an afterlife there is an afterlife, but it's only the soul and the spirit that experiences the afterlife. That when the body dies, 
the body breaks down, it decomposes, it disintegrates, and that's it, that's the end of the body. That's why you find in the Quran, there are many conversations in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asserts al ma'ad al jismani, bodily resurrection. Because there were many who rejected this notion that our physical bodies will be resurrected. And I'm sure there are many religious traditions today that maintain that when we die, it's the soul that is tormented or rewarded. That the body expires, the body is terminated, and the body has no role in the afterlife. However, the Quran time and time again emphasizes and asserts that the resurrection is a bodily experience, that the body will be resurrected. It's not just something that the soul will experience. If you go to Surah Al Qiyamah, Surah 75, verses 3 and 4. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses this idea of bodily resurrection. He says, Does man really believe that we will not gather his bones? And then Allah says, Bala qadirina ala an nusawiya banana. Allah says, Indeed, we will gather man's bones and we will do even more than that. We will eve, we have the power to even restore the human being's fingerprint. So this is a clear verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that Qiyamah is not just the gathering of the souls, it's also a bodily resurrection. In another ayah, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 259, you find that even prophets used to ask about bodily resurrection. If you look in the Quran, there are two prophets who actually ask Allah and pose this question about how is resurrection going to happen? How is this bodily resurrection going to take place? One, as you know, Ibrahim alayhi salam, where, where he asks Allah, Rabbi arini kayfa al mawta. Oh Allah, show me how you bring the dead back to life. Now Ibrahim السلام, is not asking because he doubts. Ibrahim is asking because he wants to witness the process of bodily resurrection. So there's a difference. Sometimes a question is asked because there's doubt. And sometimes a question is asked because you want, to you want to witness that process of bodily resurrection. So Ibrahim is one example. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 259, Allah gives us another example of a prophet who made a similar request, and that is Uzair. But in this ayah, his name is not mentioned. So if you look at ayah number 259 from Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, Consider the one who passed by a village or a town or a city. It was ruins. The roofs have collapsed, the, the walls have caved in, meaning that these are homes that are abandoned. There were corpses, there were bodies and bones that were disintegrated. Then Uzayr was a prophet of God. How is Allah going to bring back these human beings after their bodies have decomposed and they've become dust? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he do? The Quran says, فَأَمَاتَهُ اللَّهُ Allah caused him to die for 100 years. Then Allah resurrected him. When Uzair is resurrected after being dead for 100 years, he's asked, how long did you tarry for? How long were you gone for? How long were you dead for? For a day, I tarried for a day or part of the day. It's interesting, brothers and sisters, you find that 
You know, death is essentially when the soul is separated from the body. It seems that when the soul returns to the body, the body has a way of making us forget certain realities. So, for example, when you look at the human being, when we go through Barzakh, why is it that the kuffar who experience Alam al Barzakh, when they're resurrected and they're asked, How long did you tarry for? They say, Yoman al Ba'layom. So you find in Barzakh, we have what is called Jism Mithali. We have a, a light body. Our actual body will be joined together on the day of Qiyamah. So you find that when the soul and the when the body and the soul reunite, it causes some forgetfulness. And we see this in the case of Uzair. When he's asked, how long did you tarry for? He says, a day or part of a day. When in actuality, how long did he tarry for? A hundred years. Look at your food and your drink. They have not been spoiled. Meaning that food and that drink was preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a hundred years from spoiling. Look at your donkey. It was also preserved and resurrected. We will make you, O Uzair, a sign for people. Some scholars say that he was his nubuwa began here, that he was actually given a mission to start guiding the masses. And, and in this way, he became a sign for people because now he's teaching people about Qiyamah from the perspective of someone who's actually experienced it. وَانْظُرْ إِلَى الْعِظَامِ Look at how, look at the bones. كَيْفَ نُنْشِزُهَا ثُمَّ نَكْسُهَا لَحْمَا O Uzair, look at the way I resurrect the bones and clothe them with flesh. So you find that these are many examples in the Qur'an where the Holy Qur'an asserts that the hereafter, that resurrection is not only a spiritual experience, that bodily resurrection will indeed take place. And that's why when you look at Surah At-Takweer, Surah 81, Ayah number 7, what does Allah say? He speaks about the Day of Judgment and what will take place on that day. وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ And when the souls are reunited. Reunited with what? Some commentators, they say, with the body. In Barzakh, you have a, a certain body that is appropriate and suitable for that world. And then on the day of Qiyamah, this soul will be rejoined. Rejoined with the body, which is again is another proof of bodily resurrection. In a hadith from Imam Zainul Abidin, alayhi, and alayhi, I'll read the translation just so we can save a little bit of our time. The Imam says at the time, Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam, he says at the time of resurrection, human beings, the human bodies, man's bodies will grow out of the ground like plants. Have you seen the farmer when they plant the seeds and the plants begin to sprout? Imam al Sajjad, he says, people will come out of their graves, they will come out of the earth in the same way plants sprout from the earth and then the imam continues and he says the particles that were transformed into earth will rejoin each other through the will and the power of allah so that even the imam says so that even if a thousand people should be buried in the same grave which is probably the case in in wad salam and najaf where you have grave upon grave Imam says, even if a thousand graves, even if a thousand people occupied the same grave and their flesh and their bones became intermingled, they will separate and their earthly remains will be separated from each other so much so that they will be distinct. So you find that the ahadith, 
the verses of the Holy Quran all point to this reality of Al Ma'ad Al Jismani. Because, brothers and sisters, there were many philosophers that came forward and said, We don't have any rational evidence for bodily resurrection. You, if you look at Ibn Sina, Abyssina, as he's called in the West, he says, I cannot prove bodily resurrection using rational arguments. But he says, I concede to the reality of bodily resurrection of Ma'ad Jismani because Revelation says so. But beyond that, I don't have any evidence. So if you go to num ayah number 30, so ayah number 29, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us either of the, the same kuffar that if they're sent back to dunya, not only will they sin, but they'll also reject qiyamah even though they've witnessed it. Or Allah is speaking about a certain category of kuffar who deny resurrection entirely or deny bodily resurrection. If we go to ayah number 30, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ وُقِفُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ قَالَ أَلَيْسَ هَذَا بِالْحَقِّ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ وَرَبِّنَا قَالَ فَذُوقُ الْعَذَابَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ If you could but see, here Allah is addressing the Holy Prophet. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi obviously would become very distressed and frustrated because of the stubbornness of the, the pagans and how they would ridicule him when he would speak about Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's as though he's consoling the Prophet that these same disbelievers who are ridiculing you and who are being stubborn and narrow-minded and who vehemently reject the Day of Judgment, it's as though Allah is saying, if, if only you could see the day when they stand in my presence, when they stand before me, and I say to them, and Allah says to them directly, if you, could, if you could but see when they will be made to stand before their Lord, He will say, meaning Allah will say, Is this not the truth? This, referring to resurrection, is resurrection, is qiyamah, is the judgment, is this not the truth? What will they say? Qalu bala. Of course, they can't deny it because they're experiencing it now. They're witnessing it with their own eyes, with every atom of their being. They're witnessing this, this weighty moment. Qalu bala wa rabbina. They say, yes, by our Lord. قَالَ فَذُوقُ الْعَذَابَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ He will then say, meaning Allah will say to them, some of the Mufassireen perhaps may argue that this conversation is not between Allah and the Kuffar because there are certain disbelievers whom Allah will not even address them on the day of Qiyam. Part of their punishment is they will not even be deserving of Allah speaking to them. That they will have to speak to Malik, one of the, the angels who are the keepers of hell, meaning they've lost the privilege of divine communication. Allah doesn't speak to them, and they're not allowed to speak to Allah. And this is perhaps one of the most painful punishments that is directed towards the kuffar. So this verse, so ayah number 30, actually returns us to the vivid depiction of the kuffar you know standing at, at on the edge of jahannam so if you go back to uh, ayah number 27 again it's the language is very similar walaw tara o muhammad if you could only see them is wuqifu ala nar when they're standing in front of jahannam when they're standing in front of the hellfire فَقَالُوا And they will say, يَا لَيْتَنَا نُرَدُّ If only we could be sent back. They will be so terrified and so frightened and so petrified that they will be crying out to Allah, Oh Allah, please send us back. Send us back where? Send us back to dunya. We want to, we want to redo. We want to go back and 
have a second chance. If you send us back, we promise that we will not deny your signs. And we will be among the believers, the same believers that we used to persecute and harass. They say, we will be one of them. We will submit to you. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I'm going to question them that they used to deny so it seems that either allah or the malaika they're going to have certain conversations with them there's going to be a, a, a type of interrogation is resurrection not a reality now them admitting that ba'ath qiyama resurrection is a reality it's not going to be of any avail to them now on the day of judgment this is why Immediately after they confess that Qiyamah is a reality, that resurrection and the day of judgment, they are certain. The response is what? We're going to reduce the punishment? No. The response from Allah or from, a, from the Malaika is what? فَذُوقُ الْعَذَابِ Taste the punishment. بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ Because of because you used to disbelieve. Now here, brothers and sisters, you find that the consequences of our actions are, the, the believers actually experience the consequences. Now when you do something, sometimes you're told of the consequence, and other times you actually experience the consequences of your actions. So here you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making them experience the reality of kuf. So it's not that, you know, they committed a crime and the punishment is separate from the crime. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially telling them, taste the reality of your kuf. Taste the reality of your kuf. Divine punishments, brothers and sisters, are not arbitrary. Allah doesn't punish. What Allah does, He reveals to you the reality of your actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too generous to assign arbitrary punishments. Kufr, brothers and sisters, is in and of itself suffering. Kufr, rejection of truth disbelief in and of itself is the punishment taste the punishment because of what you disbelieved so the source of the, who's 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 the actual punisher it's the kufr that's punishing them allah is making them taste the reality of their actions so you find that human actions have real consequences and the, con the consequence, the punishment is the kuf itself. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next ayah, He says, قَدْ خَسِرَ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِلِقَاءِ اللَّهِ حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَتْهُمُ السَّاعَةُ بَغْتَةً قَالُوا يَا حَسْرَتَنَا عَلَى مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِيهَا وَهُمْ يَحْمِلُونَ أَوْزَارَهُمْ عَلَىٰ ظُهُورِهِمْ أَلَىٰ سَاءَمَا يَزِرُونَ Lost indeed are those who deny meeting with Allah. You find here, you know, the Day of Judgment has many names. Here Allah tells us that the Day of Judgment, one of the names of the Day of Judgment is لِقَاءُ الله. The reality of Qiyamah is the human being meets Allah. The veils between man and God are all removed. This is the reality of Qiyamah. Qiyamah is about man meeting his Lord. Lost indeed are those who deny the meeting with Allah until the hour comes upon them unexpectedly. 
They will say, oh, how great is our regret over what we squandered concerning it. While they bear their burdens on their backs, unquestionably evil is that which they bear. So we mentioned that Qiyamah is referred to as the Day of Judgment. One of the names of the Day of Judgment is the Day of Meeting Allah. You find that the Day of Judgment is also given another name in this ayah. So one name of the Day of Judgment is the Day of Allah's Meeting. It's also called in the same ayah, the hour, as sa'a Now why is the Day of Judgment called the hour? Now according to some scholars, they say the reason why, one possible reason why the Day of Judgment is referred to as as sa'a the hour, it's because of how quickly and how abruptly Alam al Barzakh will end and Qiyamah will begin. It's as though it's a very rapid process. You know, it's not like, you know, there are signs in Barzakh and it's a long, drawn out process. The Day of Judgment seems to come suddenly, that Alam al Barzakh ends abruptly and Qiyamah begins unexpectedly. So, in the same way that an hour is a short interval of time, the ending of Barzakh and the beginning of Qiyamah seems to be that that change will be very abrupt and very uh, quick. Also, when you look at this ayah, you notice that when the disbelievers are resurrected, when they come out of their graves, they say what? قَالُوا يَا حَسْرَتَنَا there seems to be a, a state of shock. You know, when something unexpectedly happens to you, you become startled. You almost become paralyzed with fear. This happens to you when, when, when small things happen in this life. Imagine the, the, the paralysis, the fear, the shock that these disbelievers are going to experience when they come out of their graves. This is why the Quran says they will say, Ya Hasratana. The word tahassur in the Arabic language means deep regret. When you do something and you're extremely remorseful about it and it eats away at you, this is called tahassur. When the Arabs would feel great regret, they would address regret as though it was a physical entity in front of them. That's why you see, see when we address the Imams, we say, Ya Aba Abdullah, Ya Amir al muminin Here, if you notice, there is a Ya, there is a vocative word that comes before Hasra. So the regret is so deep that it's as though, this is something that the Arabs would do, that when, when they would experience deep regret, it's as though they would visualize regret itself as a living entity, a physical entity in front of them, and they would call out to it because of how real and how painful that regret was. They say, Ya hasratana ala ma farratna fiha. That, what, 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 why are they in regret? Because they squandered the opportunity of a lifetime. And what is that opportunity? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Fakhr al-Razi, he says, he gives a kind of a commercial metaphor. He says the similitude of the kuffar and the reason why they're in such deep regret, it's like someone, it's like you taking out a loan for an investment. You take out $100,000 as a loan. It's your capital. Not only, and you invested in something hoping that you're going to generate profit. Not only do you not make profit, but you lose the capital. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a loan. He gave us aql. He gave us all of our faculties. He gave us everything that we need to profit. But the kuffar, what do they do? Not only do they not profit, they squander the initial investment which is, I think, a very beautiful way of 
illustrating why what they lost and why why they're in such a state of remorse and regret. So you find that they express this painful regret. Ya hasratana ala ma farratna fiha. وَهُمْ يَحْمِلُونَ أَوْزَارَهُمْ عَلَىٰ ظُهُورِهِمْ أَلَىٰ سَاءَ مَا يَزِعُونَ And they will be bearing, carrying burdens on their backs. Unquestionably, evil is what they bear. Now, there are the word awzar is the plural for the word wiz with a kasra on the wow. So wow, kasra, there's a sukun on the zain and there's a ra, wiz. Wiz means burden. In Surah Al Qiyamah, ayah number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions another word that is similar. Wazal. It's the same root letters, but the short vowels are a bit different. So wazar is wow with a fatha, zain with a fatha and ra. So you have wazar and then you have wiz. In ayah number 11 of Surah Al Qiyamah, what does Allah say? Kalla la wazar. Allah is speaking about the person who's dying. You can't escape death. There is no wazar. There's no refuge. So wazar, literally in ancient Arabic, means the a part of the cave, uh, a cave or a refuge in a mountain that you would seek. And then the Arabs, they modified that word, and they also use the word wiz, which refers to something that weighs a lot. And mountains weigh a lot. So wiz is a heavy burden. So Allah is telling us that these disbelievers will be carrying a very heavy burden. So wizar refers to a refuge that's often in a mountain. And because wazar refers to a, a mountain refuge, wiz refers to something weighty, something very heavy, like the mountains. So wazar, the linguist say, is It's a refuge you seek in the mountains. And wiz is something that's weighty, something that is heavy. Something that is similar in weight to the mountains. What is this burden? This is the burden of sin, some commentators say. Others say this is the burden of divine wrath. You know when you love someone, when someone is, when a very powerful figure is angry with you, it's like a weight on your shoulders. Imagine you have to go to court and you know the judge is not too happy with you. That wrath, that discontent is a weight on you. Other commentators, they say, no, this is a subtle reference to what we have, what we believe in Islamic theology as tajassud al-a'mal, the materialization of our actions, that your actions will actually take a physical form. Tajassud al-a'mal, that our actions will actually take a physical form. And there are many ahadith where the imams say that your salah, your dhikr, all of your good deeds will actually have an image. They will actually take a physical form in the hereafter. There's a hadith where the Holy Prophet he says, When the believer is resurrected and comes out of his grave, His actions, his amal salih will take on a form that will be very pleasing to him. فَيَقُولُ لَهُ مَا أَنْتْ What are you? فَوَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَأَرَاكَ مْرَأَ الصِّدْقِ That I see you as a very pleasant entity. فَيَقُولُ لَهُ أَنَا عَمَلُكِ فَيَكُونُ لَهُ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ That that being will say that I am 
the representation of your good deeds, and I will escort you to paradise. Conversely, Rasulullah says, Wa inna al-kafra idha kharaja min qabri. When the disbeliever comes out of his grave, suwira lahu amru. His deeds will take on an image. Fi suratin sayya. But they will have a very frightening, evil image. Wa bisharatin sayya fayakul man ant. The disbeliever will say, who are you? I see you as an evil, as an unpleasant being. I am your actions, I am your deeds. This being, that image will take that person towards punishment. If we go to the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُ وَلَدَّارُ الْآخِرَةِ خَيْرٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran gives us an alternative view of this worldly life. Now brothers and sisters, have any of you, most of you are probably familiar with the game Monopoly. Many of us probably played it when we were growing up. Maybe some of us even play it now. Now, Monopoly, brothers and sisters, for those of you who are not familiar with the game, I assume that most of you are, Monopoly is a game where the object of the game is to accumulate as much Monopoly money as possible, to own as much property as possible, and essentially, the goal is what? To knock out the competition. Do you know what is similar to Monopoly, brothers and sisters? Dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran tells us that this worldly life is nothing more than play and amusement. Have you seen kids when they get really into a game? Their emotions run high, they become angry, and they start losing control. What do their wise parents say to them? Relax, it's just a game. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us 124,000 prophets to tell us that this dunya is not the real life. This is just a game. This is la'ibun wa lahu. Brothers and sisters, at the end of Monopoly, when you play this Monopoly game, does the person with the most Monopoly money at the end of the game, when the game is over, does that money have any value? Can you put that money in your pocket and go to the bank and say, I want to pay cash for a house? They're going to tell you, please step out of the bank before we call the police, right? It's worthless. It has no value. On the day of Qiyamah, brothers and sisters, some people will meet Allah with a lot of money. Some will meet Allah bankrupt with nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the currency on the day of judgment is not the currency that you used to pursue or chase after in dunya. In this life, our monopoly money is the U.S. dollar. It's our houses. It's the love of people, the love of praise, the things that we covet and we chase after. These things that we fight and we're so attached to, just like the game of monopoly eventually comes to an end, the game of dunya will eventually come to an end. So when you meet Allah Azza wa Jal and you have all of this wealth, you're not going to be able to do anything with it. It doesn't have value. It's worthless on that day. What will have value on that day? What is the acceptable currency in real life on the day of judgment? Allah tells us in Surah Al-Shu'ara, Surah 26, verses 87 to 89, on the tongue of Ibrahim, 
because it's very humiliating to go to a bank with monopoly money. Can you imagine how embarrassing that is? You hand over monopoly money to the teller. It's humiliating. Ibrahim alayhi salam, what does he say? وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ Oh Allah, do not humiliate me on the day when people are resurrected. On a day when people will think that, you know, maybe my money, maybe my tribe, maybe my position in the community, maybe all of these things will help me. Ibrahim says, وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بِنُونَ On a, a day when neither wealth nor family will be any of, of any avail. Because wealth and family is like monopoly money. It doesn't have value on that day. It's not the currency of Qiyamah. What has value on that day? What can you purchase Jannah with? يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ the only thing that has value, the only thing that will be of benefit is the one who meets Allah with a sound heart, with a healthy heart, with a heart that is full of nur, that is full of faith. Al-Qalbu salim a healthy heart, a heart that is not contaminated with sin that is not diseased with sin. This is the formula for success. When Rasulullah spoke to his companions, he asked them, what is the definition of a poor person? Rasulullah he, he gave one of the definitions of true poverty. Rasulullah asks his companions, who is the truly poor person? Who is the one who is bankrupt? They say, Ya Rasulullah, a poor person is someone who doesn't have money. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, no. The truly poor person is the one who meets Allah. Allah. They meet Allah. And they have performed their prayers and they have fasted in the month of Ramadan, they have performed the pilgrimage, they fulfilled all of their religious obligations, especially the rituals, but they meet Allah as people who abused others, who slandered others, who insulted other people, who backbited against others. Rasulullah he says, these people will meet Allah thinking that they have currency. But lo and behold, on the day of judgment, they will be bankrupt. There's a hadith, and inshallah we'll conclude here. Rasulullah, he says, He's giving us two scenarios that will materialize on the day of judgment, that will happen. The Prophet says on the day of judgment there will be certain people when they are resurrected and they are standing before Allah for judgment. They will be given their book or their record of deeds. This person will look at their record of deeds and they will not see any of their hasanat. So they will complain. فيقول, such a person will complain to Allah saying, Ilahi, my Lord, Laysa Hada Kitabi. I think I have the wrong book. I think you maybe gave me the wrong book. فإني لا أرى فيها طاعتي. Oh Allah, I don't see the good deeds that I performed in my book. I prayed, I fasted, I did nawafil, I did Mustahabbat, I don't see any of my acts of worship. لَهُ It will be said to that person, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَنْسَى Your Lord does not make mistakes. This is your book. What's the problem? Why do I not see any good deeds in my book of deeds? 
They say, Your good deeds have been deleted. They have been erased. Why? Because you backbited people. Yes, you prayed. You woke up for Fajr. You did Salat al ghufayla Maybe you prayed Salat al-Layl. But when you used to sit with your friends, when you used to talk on the phone, you were always saying, did you hear what this person said? Let me tell you about what I saw this person do. You backbite it. And as a consequence, the good that you did was transferred to the people that you backbited against. This is one sin. Who will be given their book of... So this person will be given their book of deeds and they will say that there are many ta'at, there are many good deeds that I didn't perform. Are you sure I have the right book of deeds? This person is very honest. Oh my Lord, this is not my book of deeds. Because I did not perform these acts of righteousness, these acts of worship. فَيُقَالُ لَهُ It will be said to this person لِأَنَّ فُلَالَ نِغْتَابَكَ فَدُفِعَتْ حَسَنَاتُهُ إِلَيْكَ Yes, you did not perform these good deeds, but they were added to your record, your account, because so-and-so backbited against you. So my dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we go back to the ayah, He says, the things that we become attached to, they're not things that are real. They're things that are fleeting. They are things that are transient. But the final abode, the hereafter is your real home. It is your real life. And it is better. It is better for who? For those who have taqwa, for those who safeguard. You see, brothers and sisters, we may do many good deeds, but all it takes is what? One act of backbiting for us to lose the good deeds that we accumulate. So the one who will be in a good standing on the day of Qiyamah is the one who not only does good, but yet taqoon, they're cautious. They protect their good deeds. They don't spoil them with sin and with backbiting. Afala taqilun. Do you not understand? Do you not consider this? Inshallah, with ayah number 33, we'll continue that in our next session. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin. So we have some few minutes for uh, Q and A. I apologize. I really don't know why the uh, is 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 uh, the sound okay now. Uh, yeah, it's great now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is, and we're going back to the air. Uh, Sheikh, you said that um, it's the for the disbelievers. It we said it's the um, the kufr itself will be the punishment. Yes. And I, I not. I I don't comprehend the how. So. I'll give you a very simple example. I don't know if I gave this example uh, to you guys before, but imagine you have a child, you have a two-year-old, and you tell the two-year-old, don't touch the stovetop, because if you touch the stovetop, you're going to get punished. The child disobeys you and touches the stovetop. And they experience pain. That pain that they're experiencing, is it because I punish them or is it because that's the name, that's what happens, that's a consequence of touching the stovetop. So the idea here is the kufr is the, the suffering of the disbeliever is simply a result of their actions. It's not that they did something neutral and then Allah is punishing them. The action itself is destructive, but in dunya they were not aware of it because there are many veils in this dunya. Once those veils are removed, we understand the 
the real nature of these actions. Is that clear? Yeah, so I thought you so I should assume that that means the consequence is still here. right now it's, that's happening. It's just because of the whale that you cannot ah, so it, it, it's it's similar, it's almost like if I if I give you local anesthesia and I cut that area that's numb, you're wounded. But when will you feel it? When the anesthesia is gone. When the anesthesia wears off. So these kuffar, they they're already suffering, but they will feel it when the anesthesia of dunya wears off. You see. Um, Sheikh, I have a question uh, with regard to um, the day of Qiyamah that you explained. Yes. Um, so, if we think about the day of Qiyamah, what is the what is the lesson? What is the impact that it should have on our on our actions on our daily life? Um, and and with that, uh, so we, we usually keep forgetting about the day, day of Qiyamah um, unless somebody in the family dies or if we are we have a serious uh, illness, uh, we start to think about that. But um, so first of all, what is the impact that it should have? And second, what should we do to to um, to remember the day of Qiyamah more often in our daily life? No. There was a hadith from the Holy Prophet ﷺ where he, he gives advice to his companions. Because as you know, many, many Muslims, many of the companions of the Prophet, they had this attachment to this worldly life. You know, it's important for us to understand that as Muslims, we're not meant to isolate ourselves and live like monks. We have to strike that balance. So from an Islamic perspective, you're supposed to live in the dunya, but you don't let the dunya live in you. You don't let it dominate your life. You don't make it the, the direction and the, the goal of life. So the Holy Prophet tells his companions, Remember the destroyer of desires. Because you're, if you're always fixated on dunya, you're not going to develop as a human being. If you're only cater, catering to your animal needs, you will become more animal-like. If you cater and if you focus on developing the intellect, purifying the soul, that's when you become more human. So Rasulullah says, remember the destroyer of desires. They say, Ya Rasulullah, meaning the carnal, lowly desires, you know, Focusing so much on what you put in your mouth and you know just the the the, the bodily desires They ask Ya Rasulullah, what is the destroyer of desires? The Holy Prophet says al maut death now Remembering death number one Serves as a powerful deterrent from sin If I if I'm constantly remembering death, I'm less likely to partake in sin because number one I don't know when death will overtake me secondly I know that these actions or these these things that I'm indulging in I'm gonna be taken to account also death is also meant to motivate us and create this sense of urgency you know when you know that there is death and there is qiyama it creates this sense that when I when there's an opportunity to be to do good, I'm not going to delay, because this might be my last opportunity, and I want to make sure that I end my life on a positive note. That my aqibah, as we discussed in our earlier session, that my aqibah is khair. Now, practically, how do we become more mindful of death? You know, salah is actually supposed to remind us of death. You know, sujood is a physical, visual reminder that the earth is our place of origin and it's our final resting place. So being conscious of death when we're in sujood, because Allah is, you know, we're physically putting our faces on the earth, the same earth that will house our bodies when we die the same earth that will 
that will that will uh, you know the same earth that will uh, become the place where our bones will be scattered and decompose. Another way to to become more mindful of death is on Fridays after Salat al Jumu'ah, or if you have time, make an effort to go and visit the cemetery. If that is too difficult, the next time there is a death in the community, go to the funeral. Don't just say, okay, I'll read Salat al-Wahsha for the person. No, go and physically witness a burial. What's even better than that is volunteer to wash a janazah. Believe me, brothers and sisters, washing a janazah is more impactful than listening to a hundred lectures. Sometimes we need that reality check. This is, these are just some of the things that I have found to be, uh, to be useful. Shaykh, I have another question. It might be just a stupid question, but um, um, you mentioned that uh, the day of uh, Qiyamah, we can say that it's a day of uh, meeting Allah. No. So now, in my mind, um, every meeting has a purpose and some an objective what is objective and, and purpose of meeting Allah that sounds like a good homework assignment for you guys <laughs> <laughs> really I, I, I have the answer but I you know I'm curious to see you know what is your understanding of of Allah? what's the point of uh, of this meeting so maybe inshallah next class maybe first five minutes we can kind of go around and think about it you know what is the purpose of Liqa'ullah, you know, on the day of Jannah. What do you guys, a deal? So that'll, that'll be your, this is a, I'm a pretty good teacher, first homework assignment of the semester, pretty easy going, huh? <laughs> so, what is, so, so what is the goal? What is the, the purpose of Liqa'ullah? Because, I mean, just as you said, before you go to the meeting, you want to know what's the, what's the objective of this meeting, right? Correct. Because the only way to prepare for a meeting is to know you know what is the what's on the agenda? What's the what's the purpose of this? Meeting? Mm -hmm. So that that's that'll be food for thought, inshallah, for uh, for this week. Inshallah. Ahsant. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Sheikh, just a, a one question. It's kind of like on the, I guess, like the tone or just of the surah. Yeah. Or, we talked about how like uh, at times uh, the prophet is like kind of discouraged, dispirited, frustrated with people because they're not uh, listening to him or insulting him instead. Yeah. It's kind of saying, hey, look, this is what's going to happen to them. Yeah. I guess like it, maybe this is just like my incorrect understanding, but at some level it seems like that, that it seems a little bit contradictory to like my, at least my own mental image of what the prophet would be like, that like he would be Consoled by the fact that okay, hey, they're gonna get their just desserts later on. Yeah. Now, so you, you have to understand that, you know, there are there are two categories of uh, of disbelievers. You know, two general categories. You know, there are those who who knowingly reject and prevent others from seeing the light of truth, the light of faith, and then you have others who are just victims. You know, you know, they 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 fall and pray to the the propaganda of the likes of you know Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab. Now, the Holy Prophet definitely feels sympathy for those who are victims of propaganda, but the Holy Prophet doesn't feel the same sympathy for people who knowingly reject and people who become an obstacle for others to discover the truth. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, is consoling the Prophet that these people that are causing you so much heartache, not because they're personally attacking the Prophet, because they're, they're stagnating the, the, uh, the, dissem the dissemination of the message of God. So it's, it consoles the Prophet that these people will be brought to justice. Because not only did they destroy themselves, but they're depriving so many people of of this valuable guidance does that make sense yeah yeah thank you very much i have another question uh sheikh 
Um, so one of the things you mentioned is that uh, is the ayahs uh, in the Quran that say um, people that uh, some people that die uh, on the day of judgment, they say to Allah, uh, if you send us back, we will be under a mu'mineen or muhsaneen. Um, um, so th this sounds to me very logical because they're going to see the truth. Um, they're going to experience it and then say, okay, we're going to do it. We're, if you send us back, we're going to do um, have good actions. Yeah, it, it sounds logical to me. Um, so now, um, it, it it it. So my takeaway from this is uh, Allah wants us to to believe in things um, that we are not seeing and we are not experiencing. This is what He's expecting from us. Is that is that the definition of iman? Can we say that? You know, it, when I when I read that verse, I personally take I have another take home message. And that is that uh, faith that is based on fear doesn't last. That's true. Because these individuals, w w when are they proclaiming faith? When they're terrified. It's like your daughter. She's wearing hijab because she's afraid that she's going to go to Jahannam. To me, that faith doesn't last whereas if they do it out of love or out of understanding they understand the rationale and the purpose that is faith that will last that's why this iman is shaky they they proclaim faith but this is faith that is based on fear that's why when they go back gradually you know people gradually forget but if you have an aqidah based on logic and reason and it's rooted in love of God. This is this is faith that is strong and it's unshakable. Mashallah, it's good point, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Thank you very much for an excellent class as usual. Thank you so much. Keep me in your dua, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sheikh.